it, it's, it's great to be back with you in Westra Bosnia, and thank you, Rolf, for that very kind introduction. Rolf makes me sound like a distinguished politician. Actually, I'm an extinguished politician. <laughs> I was defeated at the polls five years ago by the wave of nationalism that swept across my country. Uh, but I continue to be active. And I was last here, I think, four years ago. Eric kindly invited me uh, to a conference which he hosted of the Committee of Peripheral and Maritime Regions. And uh, when he invited me again to speak about the future of Europe, I said, Eric, I'm the past of Europe. I said, I can think of at least 10 people far better qualified than I am. To which Eric replied, yes, Graham, so can we, but none of them is available. <laughs> um, they say that there are three great lies in the history of humankind. Number one is, the money that I owe you has been sent to your bank account. Number two is, of course I will love you just as much in the morning. And number three is, I'm from Brussels and I'm here to help you. <laughs> Actually, if truth be told, I'm here to ask for your help. Because I don't need to tell you that the European Union is under severe strain. Because the old division in politics between left and right has been overtaken by a new division on the politics of identity. And some people respond to this change by clinging to the old certainties of blood and religion and homeland. And they emphasize their own identity and they feel threatened by people from outside. There are others who have become the citizens of anywhere, who are perfectly at ease living and working with people of a different faith, of a different language, of a different skin color, at ease living in places sometimes far away from where they were born. And those two worldviews are clashing like tectonic plates, causing sparks to, to fly. I remember when Sweden held the presidency of the European Union in 2001, 18 years ago. And in Austria, the main right-wing party, the People's Party, did a coalition with a far-right party. And Juran Persson, who saw the danger of that, had a debate at European level. There was even a proposal to use sanctions against Austria. Well, now there are far-right parties in government, in Hungary, in Poland, in Italy, and elsewhere. They even boast of being illiberal democracies. They close their borders and their ports to refugees. Now, I don't know how long it will take us to build a liberal democracy at European level. In the United States of America, it took 170 years, and they had a civil war in the middle of it over attitudes to immigration. There is an American historian called Mark Mazower, who has written a book called The Dark Continent, predicting that Europe will once, once again go to war because of nationalism. Now, I think he's wrong. Because I think actually we buried that kind of thing in the Treaty of Frederickshamn 210 years ago, and in many other treaties. But even at my most optimistic, I am aware of the dangers, because I see it in my own country, Scotland, where a nationalist government tried to break up the member state that gives me my passport, the United Kingdom. I see it now with an English nationalism, that is trying to rip Britain away from Europe, ignoring the majorities in Scotland and Northern Ireland and Gibraltar 
who voted to stay in the European Union. Yeah, human progress depends on peace. In the European Union, we have put the mortar of Europe around the bricks of NATO to create a period of peace and prosperity that has given me and my brothers and sisters far greater life chances than our parents on a small island off the west coast of Scotland could ever have dreamt of. But, you know, it's taking the great tribes of Europe a long time to learn the lessons of the past. I am optimistic because I see the young people in my country. Because I see people clamoring for the United Kingdom to stay in the European Union. There were a million people on the streets of London last weekend arguing in favor of another referendum. There are six million people who have signed an online petition in just six days calling on Britain to pull back, to revoke its application to leave the European Union. I see it in young people in Sweden. There's a young lady called Greta Thunberg who has become the new ABBA, <laughs> the new Swedish export. You know, it's great. And I have never believed, I have never believed that my compatriots will be quite so stupid as to leave the European Union. I think most of them sense that it's a good thing. And if we were to leave, it would be the biggest act of folly in almost 2,000 years, since in the year 410, we threw out the Romans. You know, because they came to build roads and bridges and water um, systems and so on. But, you know, I'm not 100% sure. My coniferous optimism is frostbitten with worry by what is happening with the United Kingdom Independence Party, or the Sweden Democrats, or the Alternative für Deutschland, or the Front National, or whatever it is. And it's happening, at least in my country, because of where we went wrong. It's because of the poverty of national debate. If you pick up a newspaper or turn on your television, you can find far more about the choice of clothes by a particular celebrity than you will about the choice of policies by the people who we elect to govern us. We have failed properly to invest in education. We've specialized. We turn out graduates who have minds as sharp as razors and about as broad. We fail to invest in democracy. We are not sharing equally the fruits of growth, and we are not involving and explaining to people why we are working together in the European Union and what it brings for them. You know, I say to the gentleman who asked, you know, what about the money we pay to the European Union? Well, I don't know about you, but I sometimes go on holiday to places like Greece or Spain or Yugoslavia. I can stay in hotels where I will not contract a disease because they have proper functioning kitchens and proper functioning sewage systems that maybe I paid for. But still it's to my benefit and it's certainly to theirs. You know, it's too often the case that if something goes well, the government of your country says, yeah, we did that. If something goes badly, oh yeah, that's Brussels. It's easy to do all the time. And the impact of, Bre of Brexit would be terrible. The United Kingdom is already impoverished by 100 billion pounds. That's the investment that we've lost since we said we are going to leave the European Union. We have weakened and we have destabilized the European Union itself. There is a fear of a race to the bottom you know that if Great Britain is outside the European Union, wonderful, some people say, we can be like Singapore. Low taxes everywhere. We call it base erosion in economic terms. But something has happened in Britain, you know? And I, it's rather like one of the things which the scientist Einstein taught us. In one of his theories, he says, as the circle of light grows, 
so too does the circumference of darkness. And I think that the more that people have understood about what Brexit means, the more they realize what might be the implications of Brexit. And that is why people are changing their minds. They recognize that we are living in a world which is quite dangerous and quite difficult. A world in which President Trump and President Putin have started to undermine the rules-based order that we had. A world in which China is both a trade partner and a systemic rival. You know, we now trade one billion euros a day with China. At the same time, China is a totalitarian state and is becoming worse. Now, I was very pleased that President Xi Jinping, who did not get to meet the Pope in Rome, did get to meet the Holy Trinity in Paris when he met Emmanuel Macron and Angela Merkel and Jean-Claude Juncker. It's important that we talk to the Chinese, but Juncker was right to say, you people are our rivals because we have a different view of society from you. We live in a world in which countries like mine, I regret to say, and Hungary and Poland and Italy are weakening the European Union. And that is why, if I have one plea to make to you, make sure you send our very best people to Brussels, because Europe needs them. I'm optimistic because I believe that the education and the achievements of the last 50 years have built a sense of European civil society. I'm optimistic because there are NGOs using social media to go out and spread the benefits of international cooperation and people like Greta who I mentioned earlier. I'm optimistic because you have scientific developments in places like this with your node pole where we are getting on top of the big challenges of feeding a growing world population, providing water supplies, fighting climate change. You know, the, the British um, anthropologist Charles Darwin observed that it's not the strongest of the species which survives. It's not even necessarily the most intelligent. It is those who are the most adaptable to change. And if we're going to make a success of the European Union, which we need to because we are only 500 million people altogether, we need to be adaptable to change. We need a new open approach. We need what they call the three T's. Talent, technology, and tolerance, if we are going to be successful. We need to deal with a European Parliament after May, which will probably have 150 representatives of extremist parties. Still a minority, but it will make much more difficult the business of governing Europe. And it will underline how important it is that we bring people on board in each of our countries, that we actually go out and explain what we're doing and why. And we can do it, I'm quite convinced. As Angela Merkel famously said about something else, wir schaffen es. Wir schaffen es, das können wir tun. But we have to be active in doing it. Can I just finish by illustrating this with a story of something that happened to me when I was a member of the European Parliament. I was sitting at home on a Sunday morning and the telephone rang. And I picked it up and uh, it was a lady who was one of my constituents who was very upset and who told me that she and her husband had been sitting in their conservatory enjoying a cup of tea, looking out down their garden and they had seen three young men in uh, hoodies, breaking into their shed. Being an elderly couple, they rang the police. 
And the policeman said to this lady, Madam, I'm very sorry. I don't have anybody available at the moment. I will send you a policeman as soon as I can. Anyway, they did not know what to do. She discussed it with her husband, and her husband rang the police back. He said, don't worry sending anybody. I am going to take my shotgun, and I will deal with it. <laughs> now, you can imagine, within five minutes, <laughs> There were three police cars outside with their sirens blazing. There was a police marksman with a rifle on their wall, and there was a police helicopter circling overhead. And they were so quick that they caught these young kids breaking into the shed. But they were not very happy with my constituent. And they said, Madam, your husband told us he had taken a gun. And she said, officer, you told us you had nobody available. If we need to have the resources available to make this work, we can. 